So I'd like to ask the question, what's the best thing in or about miniature painting? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, okay, so the best thing about miniature painting, about this hobby, and there's so many good things, uh, I'll just say that. Like, There's a lot of honorable mentions or second, third, fourth places here. And, and I think this is true, honestly, no matter what level of skill you're at. The best thing about miniature painting is you get to create something artistic. Uh, first of all, I don't agree with practice, practice, practice. Let's let's go ahead and just bust another myth since that's uh, since that's what you and I do when we get together. Right. So today I'm here with Vince Venturella. And I'm pretty excited to talk to him because, well, for many reasons, but one of the reasons is he's probably the most hardworking man in um, miniature YouTubing. So, uh, <laughs> well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, you have over a thousand videos, I think, on YouTube. That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. something like that. So for my last interview or the last podcast or whatever you want to call this, because I still don't have a proper name for it. I got a lot of criticism for not editing the whole thing. Well, I did edit it, but it's more or less the conversation, the raw conversation, which is what I'm interested in. But apparently for YouTube, it doesn't. Well, most people don't have the attention span. Let's put it that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a proper edited introduction. Joining me on today's episode is Vince Venturella, miniature painter from Ohio. Being a hobbyist for more than 20 years, Wins has won Golden Demon trophies as well as awards in shows such as Gen Con and Crystal Brush. He's a regular instructor at Gen Con, Adepticon, and will also be teaching seminars at the Nova Open. He runs a YouTube channel that has over 1000 videos released. His hobby cheating videos cover any topic you can think of in miniature painting, from true metallics to glazing, wet blending, how to get faster at painting and how to paint for display pieces. He also has a show called Warhammer Weekly that covers all things Warhammer on a weekly basis. Who would have guessed? And he runs a regular Q&A session where he answers questions about the hobby. Well, now that the introduction is done. No, it was amazing. It was a yeah, great introduction. I, I really loved it. Thank you. I'm really proud of it. <laughs> so let me explain where I'm coming from because I tried to do a lot of research about you. And usually I know the people that I interview a lot better. And I have to say, I did not find everything I wanted to find. So maybe we can go through that in the interview. Oh, um, good. I remain a man of mystery. I'm an enigma. I'm excited. Well, that's, I mean, partly it's because I know the, the European miniature painters better. I don't have any, or n no, yeah, not a lot of connections to the US painting scene. Right. So I would like to dig into that a bit too. and get to know you and the scene in, in the US a bit better, maybe, hopefully. Yeah. But let's start with you. And I would like to know what your focus is with miniature painting, if there's any, or maybe you just like to do everything. Yeah, sure. So it's a it's a good question. I uh, if, if you can figure it out for me, I'd love you to tell me, because I do feel that I'm somewhat of a, a gadfly in this way. I, I certainly came into this through gaming, right? Like uh, like many people, uh, gaming was my gateway drug in. Playing Warhammer, more time, 40k, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, the, for a long time, I just painted to paint just because I needed painted things on the table. And so I, I did a lot of hate painting for many years where I'm angry at it. So that's just hate painting where you... You know paint needs to get on this, and you're literally just like, go, just go, just go, stupid color. And so that was my many years of experience. And then back in mm, something like 2014, let's say, I decided to, that I wanted to be a better painter rather than just a painter. And so I started taking steps to try to improve the quality of my painting. And I think overall, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I probably have some kind of Pokemon-like uh goal where you know i want to be a really good painter i want to be the best as it were uh so like something in that even though that's a completely undefined and impossible term but i am always trying to push myself uh i like painting display pieces but i also still like play painting armies and and do still play a lot of games 
Uh, I like painting busts. I like painting chibis. I kind of like everything, and I paint everything because it helps break up the helps break up the monotony. I find doing any one thing for too long really flat, right? Like it just it gets boring after a little while if you're just doing really high quality Space Marines or something like that. And I don't mean that as a, as a dig. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> you're you're well known for your amazing quality space marines but you do a lot of other stuff too i think for you this comes out in stuff like and, and i don't know maybe we're simpatico here because you have sculpting you do amazing sculpts that are just incredible you paint a lot of different things and so i i think that even though probably a lot of your viewers came to know you through the marines because that's a you know sort of a, a bunch of popular things for me it's the your passion comes out in these other projects as well right you have to keep it varied does that make sense yeah, yeah it does because i i'm probably worse when it comes to that than anyone else because for me when i do something and i feel like okay it's 90 percent done then i kind of know okay i i was able to achieve it or i couldn't do it again uh it, basically with everything so my th my thesis for university i wrote about 75% of it, um, you know, up to where you present the interesting things and the, the thesis behind it and what you were trying to find out. And then all the, the boring stuff came in. Right. That isn't really a, a challenge that anyone can do, you know, when they, when they enter university. And the rest took me five years to finish. <laughs> so. Right, right. I already knew, okay, I could can do research. And so it's the same thing with, with painting. Whenever I have something finished to about 90%, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I know I can do it. Do I really have to finish this? And then I have this other right. idea that I want to, to do. <laughs> <laughs> or let's say these other yeah. 10 ideas. Yeah, exactly. I think that there's a... Once you sort of are painting at a competition level or a display level or whatever we want to call it. And, and what the heck even these terms mean is obviously amorphous, right? But you come to realize that just painting well, uh, it, it, one, isn't enough. And two, is often a matter of, are you willing to spend double the or triple the amount of time you've already spent on the last 10 to 20% of what you're doing, right? Because it's, it's refinement. It's, it's all the little touches, the little things that are going to make it stand out and make it you know really impressive incredible apart from everything else and i find that that's often where i'll just be like nah <laughs> right like this isn't actually going anywhere i'm good with it right here we can call it a day so but for you it's more i want to do uh display pieces but also uh paint an army maybe for example so it's that yeah exactly uh -huh. yep it's all and that's always the challenge right because I do still like playing most of these games, and so I do still want to have armies. And so when I look at an army and go, oh, I only need 80 of this figure painted, I want to bang my head up against a wall, right? Because I just, I don't really enjoy that. I don't mind small units. I find that kind of stuff interesting. So, you know, a unit of three or five people, sure, okay, that's a fun time. A unit of 40 people, I'd probably rather, like, stick my hand in a garbage disposal. It's not, it's not a good time. I mean, for me, it's... Uh, skirmish systems so confrontation obviously been right. diving back into that uh, rabbit hole a bit during the last video and also yeah just looked at my collection and usually i don't like to paint really similar things as you said um and i just really try to stay away from it but these were you know you had the archer and then you had um a melee character and maybe so yeah maybe a big bruiser and then you had the um, the infantry infantry uh, type figures and you only had a maximum of three of right. the same thing so yep. yeah and you ended up having 20 really individual figures that were tied together by an overall theme and that was really perfect for me and i actually played with these figures too so <laughs> yeah that that worked out and it had that as you said Dif a slight difference where you can say, okay, today I want to paint the, the small infantry model and, to and tomorrow I'm going to paint my uh, dirt clone or whatever was the, the yes. Yeah. It's a wonderful world we live in because uh, 
really skirmish games have just taken off in the past couple mm-hmm. years and it's it's a great thing even you know games workshop makes a bunch of different skirmish games skirmish e games now osprey does a ton of different good skirmishy games like there's just they're all over the place and so you can have a lot of different experiences where you're building your warband and one of the first uh, miniature lines that I really started being interested in taking to display or competition quality that I would go to competition with was Malfo mm-hmm. crews because they're very distinct. They're very different. They're very, they're kind of cool characters. I like that steampunky aesthetic and yeah, it get, you know, it's okay. Here's eight figures or 10 figures or something like that. You're going to do. And it, it kept you interesting and it also lets you really hone in and focus. Right. Yeah. And you can invest whatever time you want to into this character and then just, finish up the rest uh, up to a gaming standard so to me that's even more offers even more possibility to pour everything you want to do into one character and then just finish the rest maybe as yeah 100 percent. Yeah. so y- you were saying and rightfully so that the whole thing of of miniature painting it offers so many possibilities to do different things so i'd like to ask the question and it's an open question, so answer whatever comes to your mind, however related right. or unrelated it might sound. What's the best thing in or about miniature painting? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, okay, so the best thing about miniature painting, about this hobby, and there's so many good things, I'll just say that. Like, There's a lot of honorable mentions or second, third, fourth places here. Sorry, but I, the you also have to be careful because when you say, okay, one thing is the best thing, you're going to alienate everyone else because it's a really <laughs> touchy subject. So I'm just putting that out there. Fair enough. I'll, I will I will tread through the landmines carefully. Uh, no, but I have a simple answer. And, and I think this is true, honestly, no matter what level of skill you're at. The best thing about miniature painting is you get to create something artistic. Human beings have an innate desire to create things, and especially artistic things. I mean, cavemen drew on walls, right? Like this is truly in our DNA, in the 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 singular truth in the history of mankind for all of our existence was the need to create something that was artistic, that was creative, that was some kind of outlet like that, right? And I should also state that oftentimes these things that were created, not always, but often, had windows into conflict and war, right? Go back to those same cavemen where they were often painting, hunting big animals or stuff like that, right? Uh, So many famous uh, paintings that come out of sort of the era of the masters are are scenes of battles or post battles or soldiers or generals or things like that. Now, of course, that's also because the Patreon system at that time was such that, that, you know, very powerful people paid artists money to paint them. Right. So of course you painted Kings and generals and stuff like that. They were the people with the money, but nonetheless, it became the history of that. And up to now where we paint little figures that are often, but not always, you know, soldiers or barbarians or warriors or, you know, space Marines or whatever. So I think there's absolutely a thread there. And and just creating something feels pretty awesome. Uh, it's amazing to, to you start with something that is a bunch of little pieces of plastic or resin or whatever, never metal if you can avoid it. And you then, through some strange alchemy of glue and water and pigment, end up with a thing that is your vision and or something approximating that. And, and that's super cool. Like, what an awesome thing we get to do. That's just, that's just incredible. Yeah, I agree completely. I would probably have answered, well, I would probably have answered very similarly. Maybe not with that broad um, <laughs> paint, you know, stroke of, of a brush. But sure. that, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting, well, basically what I would say too. Um, so... You mentioned it briefly. There's definitely the archetype. And I'm sorry, I'm just, you know, whatever rabbit hole I find, I jump Let's do it, man. I'm following you along. Yeah, let's go down any rabbit hole you want. Yeah, if at any time you have something that you want to add or just interrupt me and and say something else that you find interesting, just please do that. Um, 
So the archetype of the barbarian or warrior type is yep. really prevalent in the hobby. So do you have any other explanation for that? Or would you say what you just explained is exactly why this is? Because you, when you open Putty and Paint, for example, or any other platform, in the top 100, you're going to find maybe 50 barbarian type naked dudes. So sure, what's sure. What's the deal with that? Well, one, uh, witness the muscularity, right? Uh, it's just the human form in a perfected fashion, which, by the way, often happens in both male and female figures, right? Yeah. Uh, is something that is interesting and exciting and complicated and nuanced and expressive to paint. Uh, there's a reason that we... Uh, that we all have these sort of perfected things. One, there's some probably aspirational, you know, element to it. Two, it's a good palette to work with. Like, I love painting big shirtless dudes, okay? Like, I'm I'm very on board with that. I admit that openly because it's fun, right? Like, working with the muscle structures and stuff like that, like, it's, it's cool to work with those volumes like you feel like you can really make something expressive when you're working in that space and i tend to enjoy that as well it's funny to me that the to me like the number nice two would be weird bony undead you see a lot of like undead kings and whites and skeletal things you know what i'm saying like those kind of dead guy things are often very prevalent there's so many 54 and 75 millimeter sculpts of, of these dead things right and they're the next layer down, right? The muscular dudes are this extremely thin layer of skin stretched over a perfected human musculature. Mm -hmm. If you strip that away, you get the bony boys that are just like a human skeleton. It's like we're looking through an anatomy textbook that has like transparent pages where we can just lift it up and we keep finding the the next project we want to do, right? So I think it's just the human form is is fascinating. It's one of the reasons that I like to break up my projects by doing big robots and tanks and stuff every so often, because it's so orthogonal mm. to that. I was going right. It challenges you in a different way. Sorry, I was going to say um, that's kind of the hot thing right now is a bit of a mix where you have these science fiction characters. I mean, it's mainly um, females in in armor. That, yeah, just like pinups, not really pinups. Sometimes it's really strong women and all that. Um, so I feel like we often are in a, a rush. Well, someone comes comes out with a really popular miniature and or maybe two or three incidentally come out with similar miniatures of that type. And then everyone just does that. And right now, I think I feel like we are in the age of the science fiction character um mostly female sometimes male yeah i think that's that's got some well there's you know i mean there's always going to be a big uh, a big love of fantasy oriented things right so it's not i i completely agree with you but i i of course uh, just to stop the inevitable pushback of somebody commenting below yes there's still plenty of fantasy busts right like there's still plenty of good interesting fantasy busts and, and large figures and, and 54 and 75 millimeter which is what i'm generally talking about when we're, i think we're doing this yeah. right um but i agree with you that sort of aesthetic well first of all the science fiction aesthetic is so much more broad than the traditional fantasy aesthetic as it's construed you know science fiction is sort of everything it's it's kind of everything of every place and every time including fantasy mm -hmm. Right, you can you can take a, a alternate you can take a and that. Yeah. yeah exactly exactly you can take a, a a barbarian esque female figure and give her a laser gun and suddenly it's it, it's a completely different narrative than if she had a sword in her hand right and that's not going to feel fantasy it suddenly feels sci fi even though ninety percent of that miniature is uh you know looks like ten thousand B C or something right. Uh, so I think science fiction is just such a broad category. And also, there's an innate contrast in that that's probably aesthetically pleasing. Like, you know, you did an awesome video all about contrast and how contrast, you know, matters and, and is the, the thing you should be focusing on. And, of course, 
contrast, as you say in there, can come in many different forms, right? The most common way we sort of think about it is in in value, right, or or in the hues. But contrast is also in surface type, and I think those kinds of science fiction miniatures present that. You have a lot of rounded, soft surfaces in the female form, and you have a lot of hard edges and flats and cold surfaces in the science fiction armor, right? And so that presents this nice sort of uh, aesthetic contrast right there. When you then go to paint it, you're going to be able to express that even further, right? So I think there's probably an innate advantage to something like that that is just kind of there on a subconscious level that sculptors like too. Right? Sure, yeah. I think, yeah, I, I think I agree. It's, as, yeah, especially as you get more and more uh, knowledge in painting and your skills increase, you are actually looking for, yeah, express more expressive things where you can add, you know, two things together. Um, like you said, the more round shapes, um, more natural organic shapes, and then you have the hard edges of the armor. I think that actually becomes um, a really interesting topic to to work with and you know juxtaposition and maybe <clears throat> right yeah mm -hmm. um so i kind of want to go back to wh what i said initially or maybe that was off cam before we started recording i don't remember <laughs> anymore sure. it's all a br blur already <laughs> um so i did my research about you um Obviously, I, like I said, I know a lot of the European painters better than, than I know uh, the, uh, the US painters. Um, but you are, as far as I could find out, a central figure of Gen Con. Would you say that? And I've, I, I've done fairly well there, if that's what you mean. I go there every year and participate. Yes, I like it very much. It's a good, it's a good miniature hobby event. Yes. So is that your go-to event? Uh, and is that because it's it's close by, or is that because it's the most prestigious, or what's the reason behind that? Uh, it's part of an event that I was already going to for years. So I've gone to Gen Con is a massive, massive uh, gaming convention. I know there are several big gaming conventions in Europe, so you'll have to tell me if this is like on scale or not, because I don't I don't have any conception of how big they are. So Gen Con's about seventy thousand people. Yeah, okay? I don't think we have anything like that here. I think the Salute. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong now. I think it's the Salute in the UK, but that is probably a fraction of that still. So. Gotcha. So. It's just a very big, and keep in mind, that is a, a gaming convention dedicated to everything gaming, mm -hmm. role-playing, tabletops, board games, everything, right? So it's just, it's all in there. And I, it's actually the competition that I sort of first became aware of miniature painting competitions, because I went to Gen Con anyways, and they have this really great area that's sort of in the center of where a lot of people walk through in this massive convention, and I, I had you know, just kind of started painting for some fun uh, again. Like I had, I had always painted armies, but it was off and on, you know, you'd paint, I'd paint a little bit and then I wouldn't paint for a couple months, but I started getting back into a more regular hobby. And I was there at Gen Con and I walked by and saw that. And I was like, Oh neat. They have competitions for this stuff. That's kind of cool. And, you know, I wasn't really tapped into the scene. Like I was vaguely aware in my head of golden demon, but I never went to games day or was aware of games day in the U S I thought that golden demon at that time was just a UK thing. Right. Like that was what was in my head. And uh, so I said, you know what? I, I really want to do, I want to come back here and I want to compete. So it became sort of the first thing that I would, that would motivate me. Now, since then, I mean, uh, I, I go to probably four or five miniature focused competitions a year uh, here in the States. Uh, and obviously I'll go to Golden Demon now at Adepticon coming up here in a month. Previously, I had always gone to Crystal Brush, which was, I think, probably the most prestigious, whatever that means, uh, here in the U.S. Uh, I, the one I actually enjoy the most is the Capital Palette, which happens at at, um, at Nova, at another gaming convention, and that was started and has been run by Dave Cowell and, or, and um, or sorry, Dave Taylor. Wrong person. Wrong Sorry, continent Dave. too, I think. Too many Daves. Yeah, wrong <laughs> continent. Yes, exactly. Too many Daves by Dave Taylor and um, uh, and Roman, obviously, who sort of took charge of it several years back and, and runs an amazing thing. And Roman was so much of an inspiration and help to me as I decided I wanted to start 
you know, really taking competition seriously because when I first went there and, you know, I managed to get some medals, but it wasn't where I was hoping, but he was really helpful with feedback. And I feel like I learned just a tremendous amount from him and his feedback and the way I think about competition. So that there's, you know, there's a lot of different competitions here in the States. What I love about Gen Con is it was this one where I set my goal. I saw so there was a painter named uh, Marika Reimer. Uh, she doesn't paint much anymore. I believe she's actually a like a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think she's doing research and stuff like that now. But she has a site called Destroyer Minis and does beautiful work. Yep. Did a lot of Dark Sword mm -hmm. stuff. And she would win like she would take best in show for the first couple of years I was there. I would see that she was just she just dominated, right? And I kind of set a goal to myself that said, like, within five years, I want to be able to get a best in show, you know, at this competition. That's what I wanted. And I was able to get it within three, which I felt really proud of. It was a, it was a huge moment for me to, to win that. I was, I was so beyond thrilled. I mean, obviously. And uh, humbled because I didn't think I was going to get it that year. So that was, <laughs> you know, that was a pretty, pretty big surprise. And it just became an area of focus uh, where I really like it. I love who, who runs it. It's a really great people, a group of like judges and people who run it. They're super transparent in their judging. The judges spend lots of time giving you feedback. They'll stand there at the case. They'll talk to you for a half hour, an hour. Um, when you pick up your pieces, you get a stack of sheets, like score sheets from every judge that has how they scored you in like the four categories that sort of break it down, like your painting, your technical application, stuff like that as well. Then usually handwritten notes from everyone of what they liked and what they didn't like. Mm -hmm. So the judges really put in the time and I think it's a great competition and it's been growing the past couple of years in a big way. So that's exciting. Yeah, no, that's definitely nice. So um, while in Europe we have, you know, a lot of, I guess the most prestigious painting competitions that are also the highest quality, hands down. Um, there's definitely a lack of um, yeah events that kind of bring all aspects of the hobby together. I don't. I, I kind of miss that because even though I'm, yeah, yes. it, it's nice. It's really nice. Yeah, because even though I'm not a huge player of games, nice to meet you. Um, I still appreciate that. Basically, a lot of innovation in the miniature hobby would not be there if not for you know the the gaming companies and uh, the companies that made miniatures widely known and uh, yeah as a hobby. So yeah, they end up being the gateway drug exactly, for a lot yeah. of people, right? Like myself, I wouldn't be buying display miniatures from from you know these amazing artists who do such wonderful sculpting work if I hadn't started by finding a game that I thought was cool, full of plastic toys, mm -hmm. right? Like that was my gateway drug into the, into the, into the hobby. So how excited are you for the golden demon coming back to the U S? <laughs> oh, buddy. Uh, I am real excited. My friend, uh, I, here's how excited I am for the past couple years. I've competed in the Golden Demon in the UK. Oh, really? That's one of the competitions I go to every year. I fly I from where I live in Ohio to the UK to participate in Golden Demons. In the year when, when they had multiple, right, when they still had the small demons, yeah. I would go to Fest and always one other. Uh-huh, okay. Okay? So that's how much Sneaky. I care about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw you won a Bronze Demon, I think, in... 2018 yes correct so yeah i took I've, I've won two bronze demons over my time uh both in units ironically i guess although different units uh one was the 40k necromunda for my escher gang and one was for age of sigmar unit so uh, when yep. was the age of sigmar unit because that didn't show up on demon winners also on <sighs> demon winners you're from the uk so Oh, how nice. That's cool. Neat. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I'd have to go back and look. I think it was early 2019, mm -hmm. maybe, okay. or, or the end of 2018. It's on the, I like, the units there on the, like, if you go to the Golden Demon big thing, I'm in the big list there with the unit, but I don't, I don't oh, okay. know. Yeah, I, like I said, I saw the Escher gang. Uh, that was really, yeah, that was really, um, so I, I like the, uh, the use of, 
of colors that you have there. It's a bit more. It's not the traditional. Um. Oh yeah, it's pure synth wave. Like literally, I spent so much time going uh, online and finding articles of just and an art of cool synth wave stuff. You know, just pictures of like synth pop, synth punk, uh, women that I like that had cool outfits and used colors and and I really love that hot pink electric blue uh turquoise deep purple color scheme combination that is synthwave right and uh i'll also say the thing i'm su somewhat proud of in that unit is that i had converted all those girls every one of them is converted because a bunch of them i cut their limbs off and replaced it with cybernetic limbs that was before belladonna came out mm -hmm. The, which is the special character mm -hmm. for Escher, who is all cybernetic, and her limbs look very much like what I had originally chosen for their cyber limbs. And I was like, "Yes, nailed it." I'm not in any way saying that the sculptor was inspired by my no, thing. He was, he I'm was. sure he had his done Let's years be before I did mine. Sure, I'm just stoked that I managed to also be thinking the same thing, right? So it was. Cool. I mean, I guess one, yeah. once you are a, a bit more emerged in or immersed into um, the background lore. I think that's that's even the obvious choice to make, right? For aren't Escher like these uh, type of? Isn't that the house that uh, is is really into cybernetics, or am I completely wrong there? I might be. I'll be honest. I don't okay. know. <laughs> so because... Here, here's what I'll say. Okay. Let me let me yeah, go down yeah. this rabbit hole real quick, if I might. This is the biggest challenge to me. With Golden Demon. I was going okay? to say, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, go on. <laughs> because I don't pay attention to lore. And, like, I have a vague conception of what things are. Like, I get things at a high level. And I'm like, yeah, that's good enough. Like, I understand Ultramarines are blue. And they're, like, one of the founding chapters. And Rabute Gulaman is their leader their prime mark or whatever. Like I got basics. I get the basics. Okay. But when you're doing space Marines for a golden demon, you can't just like have a conception of the basics. Like, cause you've got to put chapter markings and things and, and you know, a, campaign awards and stuff like that on these guys. And they all have to be sensible and they all have to be in the right place. Like when I did, I did an Imperial fist primaris captain in 2019. And, he did not win anything, even though I was really, really, really proud of him. But he was in 40k single figure, so pfft, whatever. Yeah. You know, that's just a crapshoot. Like that's, you, there's there were 20 other amazing miniatures that I would have said are better than mine, who also didn't win anything. Right? That's just the nature of of single figure at Golden Demon. But I know one of the things that turned people off was that I used a bit of green. Okay. But he was like a captain. And when I read it, it said, well, captains can customize their, their armor mm -hmm. and their sort of accoutrement because they have some freedom to do it. But then I talked to people and they're like, yeah, well, the green is still too far. That's not an Imperial fist color. You know, it doesn't fit. I'm like, ah, darn it. So now, so I went back, I'm doing another Imperial fist for the upcoming golden demon. And I spent days researching every little thing about a lieutenant like where every marking would go and what are what are valid campaigns for for the imperial fist that they went on and who do they fight like i got into the detail and the the need of of golden demon to have adherence to the ip really is hard for me in 40k mm -hmm. because 40k has this deep lore right and i just don't care like i don't mean to be mean i just don't care like it's too much so now i just figured out the solution just paint chaos that's the answer like stop paying attention to the imperial guys that have all that that uh bureaucracy and and, and order and be chaos where you can just be like yeah that's good that's you know it's chaos gotti we're cool it's fine listen i want <laughs> i want a golden demon and so a first place in 40k single with a chaplain that was all blue armor. What? Who? The, what? What happened here? But That's... to be honest, that was during a, a phase when when you could be more creative with golden demons. So that's back when you had golden demons in um, Spain, Poland, oh, sure. yeah, yeah. Germany, Italy. Yeah, so more like that phase. 
and they didn't care that much uh, about you know being super hardcore with the lore. I guess it's mainly because the, they were national judge teams. They were not the one judge team that is judging every single golden demon. Now. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so it's probably gotcha. mainly because of that. So. But it's still fun. So. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. No, that's amazing. That's great. Good for yeah. you. I love I, I love uh, looking at, like, especially the, the Spanish Golden Demons. Obviously, like, I follow Golden Demon Compendium on Insta, and I love uh, looking at that stuff from the, the Spanish Golden Demons because they're always just so unique and cool. Like, I, something about Spain, I don't know what it is, but they, they always have a, a great uh, eye for doing weird, unusual stuff. But at any rate, that's... So, you know, I, I go to fantasy a lot more because fantasy isn't like that. Like, you can be in the IP in fantasy in a lot easier way. It doesn't have those layers mm -hmm. of years and years of deep uh, deep lore, like some 40K stuff does. Yeah, I mean, going back to what you said about Spain, um, the Spanish Golden Demon, that was really a time when the, the Golden Demons were a prestigious, I mean, they still are, but more on a, a level of, okay, everyone does Warhammer and knows Warhammer, so it has to be the best painting competition in the world. Um, right back then you could truly be creative and they would reward creative paint jobs and it was also open to new techniques and while they say okay we we really want you to do your own thing and be creative uh, I'm sorry do your own thing and do new things but make sure it's really neatly painted and that's the main focus um, that just kills every you know attempt to to be creative and come up with something new and interesting it's it's out of focus is like you said the the lore has to be correct so they always say when you're painting an orc and it's not green then you're already lost so that's a bit of a downer for me always with with golden demons these days because it, it just becomes a a thing of i mean obviously i'm I'm not saying that they don't produce great paint jobs and everyone who invests 200 hours into their entry and creates something nice and really beautiful within those guidelines. Obviously, there's still great artists in Golden Demons, but it becomes it also what it also becomes is uh, a lot of trying to tick boxes. And I just don't like that in creative competitions or creative endeavors. endeavors. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. I get it. It's yeah, I mean, it's. It's, it's interesting to me. I mean, I love the competition and I don't mind. I think you just have to be aware of the, the, the nature of the competition, right? Every competition that I've ever been in has some kind of bias, True. right? And I think people hear that who don't compete as much and they're like, oh, well, that's bad. There should be this objective standard. And it's like, no, that, that doesn't exist. This is ultimately yeah, art it's not in the nature and competition of art. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Competitions have to decide the type of thing they value, right? Do they value technical proficiency above all else? Sort of, you know, kind of wild use of artistic expression and color and stuff like that. And, and these things all have to exist in different balance and different things that people are going to appreciate because they can bump up against each other, right? Uh, it, there, there is some level of mutual exclusivity to this stuff. There's no perfectly technical impressionist painting because it's not meant to yeah. be right that's that's not what the point of the thing is right and so when you when you're doing that sort of concept pulled into figure painting um uh, which i think people like when i think of something like that i think of uh something like the 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 couple from craft world right and the way they use uh, color and stuff like that it feels much more much more impressionistic mm -hmm. in, in that they'll it's just color everywhere right it's it's all hues and uh that's not they don't have that technical refinement of like this is all blue so it needs to be in different colors of blue and blah 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 and stuff like that right uh and that's all fine i think it's good i love that competitions have different areas of focus it means that you get to paint different things and you can go to different competitions that align better with what you like to do that's a cool thing it's not bad it's good yeah, definitely. You just have to kind of know what you're signing up for, I think. So right. The, uh, so you can't go in there and... I mean, I come, I come back to that every time for some reason. But 
I get like that too, but you just have to be aware that, okay, this is a competition and has a frame that is set by either the company or judges or whatever. And you kind of have to be aware of what you're entering into. And then yeah, just work absolutely. With that. Or not. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong <laughs> yeah, with it. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or just paying what yeah. you want, but then set your expectations exactly. accordingly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, you have been mentioning all the other, um, like Crystal Brush, that was at Adepticon and it was, yeah, Nova yeah. Open. Um, mm -hmm. So you also do a lot of teaching at these events. And yes. Um, what would you say? Well, first of all, what kind of classes are you teaching usually? So it's usually stuff focused more on, I mean, at big conventions, it, what I like to teach are shorter classes focused more on helping beginners or intermediates take their next step mm -hmm. up. That's what I enjoy doing. So I, at almost every convention, I'll teach stuff about, you know, how to blend or uh, I love teaching about metals, about true metallic metals, because I actually really love using true metallic metals. I'm a big stand for true metallic metals um, and, and actually treating them as though they were non-metallic, like integrating the same lessons and, this, and teaching people how to make metals look good, like you're actually doing something with them as opposed to just like painting st a steel color and then washing it and being like, yep, got it. And I just, I, I can't stand that. Metal is such a cool, unique surface in the world. It has such interesting properties. And I love that, that things like, that these paints exist where we can play in this. Uh, that's not to say I don't paint NMM. I certainly do. I just, I really enjoy it. And And for army painting, you tend to want to use TMM because you're, it's, you're not viewing the miniature from singular angles. You're looking at it from all over the place. It's in rooms that have bad lighting and stuff like that, right? So uh, TMM just has a better look at an army level when you zoom out and you're looking at 50 figs on a table or something, right? So I really like teaching that kind of stuff, like how to make, how to help people level up. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, speed painting. I do, I do a couple of speed painting classes. I'm not opposed to speed painting at all. I think people should challenge themselves and up their speed muscle, as it were, to channel Sam Lens for a moment, uh, because you it's a good lesson. You will learn by set, setting yourself a limit. Uh, you, what can you do in two hours, in four hours, in five hours, in whatever, right? Uh, I think that that can push you to help understand how you're attacking a figure, how you think about it, and it can make you better overall at the same time. So yeah, that's kind of stuff I teach. Yeah, I kind of do that too, but my my time frames are usually like five days. <laughs> what can you do in five <laughs> days? Sure, that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, I think there's a lot of value to setting a limit, mm -hmm. right, with yourself, because it it helps you to see to figure out how to achieve things more efficiently, right, and. Uh, that's one of the reasons that people will often ask. I'm sure you get this question too. How long did that take you to paint? Yeah. And I and and I, I you generally have an answer, but the subtext of that answer, whenever you and I get together, Trevarian, I feel like it's time to start busting some some commonly asked questions. Cause last time we talked, we had the whole recipe conversation, right? And how recipes don't really mean much often. And now it's painting time. Painting time doesn't mean much because how long it takes me to paint something is not how long it would take you to paint something, right? You might be twice as fast as me or four times as long as me, depending on where you're at in your journey and how much you've developed your, your speed to efficiency ratio, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we are all different and some things just come more natural to to me than they do for you and the other way around so it really doesn't matter how long it took me because you could probably do that i'm a really slow painter still even though i i'm not as slow as i used to be 10 years ago so i'm pretty sure that there's a lot of painters that can achieve the uh, same thing uh, in a fraction of the time and <clears throat> yeah it, it really is not something that matters in the grand scheme of yeah, right. this finished miniature that you're looking at. Uh, I also mostly can tell. I don't. I have no idea when I paint. I'm in a a place that doesn't have time. It's like okay, let me paint that brush stroke. Oh, it's ten hours later. Hmm. Yeah. Right. right. For me, it's just a matter of because my schedule is so regular when I paint 
Like I have a certain amount of hours I paint every yeah. day. And then on the weekends I paint for a much longer period of time. So I can just literally count back and go, this is how many days I was working on it and get to a number real easily because every day I paint the same amount of time more or less. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, are you a more methodical painter because when in general, because of that, or is that just coincidence? You, you just have to adhere to a time frame, and that allows you a couple of hours each day or each week. Uh, because personally, I am not structured at all. I just, you know, start a paint job and I have no idea what I'm going to do. And then it just exists sometime after a couple of hours. Again, I'm just trying to find out, are you, is that structure also within your painting or not at all? Oh yeah, no, it's a great question. So Picasso did 26 full versions of like his most famous work before he painted the actual one. And even then he had like all these careful sketches and, and uh, size comparisons and, and stuff like that. If you look at Van Gogh's work and you pull up the paint, you see all these careful work he did with geometry and lines, making sure that like where he, he sketched out everything to make sure all the, the, um, the horizons were perfect and the angles and the lines were correct for the depth. And if you pull up uh, the paint, if you, if you scan under a Cezanne, you see a white canvas, right? Uh, because he didn't have, he walked out into a field and said, I'm going to paint this mountain today. And then he painted that mountain and that was it. And he just kept, doing it uh i'm the latter one i have a regular amount of time because i'm an addict and when you're an addict you have to do things regularly right that's what addiction means but and i just the way i've found to keep my life sane is to schedule because i want to make sure i'm spending time with my wife and i still have a job and stuff so i have to i have to sort of bucket that out but then when it comes time to sit down and start painting man it's like well let's just start figuring out how this works like you know I'll generally do some color scheme kind of thought. And by color scheme, I mean, like, I want this to, I think, be have a lot of blues and oranges. That doesn't mean I went and got paints and said it's going to be this particular blue and this particular orange and that kind of stuff. And it's going to go here. And this is how every belt is going to be colored. No, no. Uh, I am the opposite of that. I'm just like, well, let's figure out how this goes and start walking down the road. And it probably goes somewhere that's a painted miniature. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's kind of interesting to find out that we are not that difficult, uh, different in most aspects. I mean, to someone on the outside, it might look really different because, um, like you said, you still have a lot of different interests within painting, uh, and I mainly do. I, I just have a compulsive disorder. I want to say, when it comes to perfectionism. Hmm. Well, I, just, I I wish I could get yeah. that disorder. It's a very, it's a big challenge you, for me. No, I don't think you want it because <laughs> then again, that's not super true because like I said, when I'm done 90% with it, I just drop it, but I just have to do a certain, um, yeah, level of end result and then I'm, I'm happy, but yeah, anyway, uh, we are not that different. In, in those things, it's it's kind of interesting to find that out. Um, so have you um, had any period during painting or during your painting journey where you were not happy at all with painting as a hobby? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, other than I talked about sort of the hate period at the beginning, but let's talk since I started like actually buckling down and like trying to be a painter that wasn't just, you know, painting to have paint on things. And and the answer there is really no. I mean, there were moments there were moments of sadness or frustration or or whatever, where I went to a competition and thought I was going to do like I was going to win something and then didn't win something. Right. And that's that always sucks, I guess. Right. Like I'm still a human being. We have expectations. Uh, there was a couple years in a row where I was, I know I was in like fourth place at crystal brush and, you know, so like that, which meant you don't get anything. Everybody's fourth place, but like the, where I knew like the, that, that I had just missed the mark. Cause I had talked yeah. to people and they said, yeah, yeah, you were, you were just outside of it. And that always really hurts when you're that close to when you can like just feel your fingers scrape the brass ring and then miss, you know, um, but that's a passing thing. Like you're, you're kind of sad that day. And then 
the next day you're like oh, i'm gonna show them next year right like i'm a, I'm a kind of bounce back person it just it just fe- feeds the fuel that like all right if that's fine if that wasn't good enough we'll do better we can do better let's go and i'll, I'll go home and i'll start working the next day on something for next year's competition because that's just it's sort of the nature of how my brain works i don't think i've ever been unhappy with painting it is very much a happy place for me it's relaxation it's zen it's meditation it keeps me even in the way that people who go do yoga do right it's the same thing for me yeah that that's true um well for me it's not always like that um i mean i'm telling a story every time i speak to someone but i just quit for years um but that's mainly because I was having so many expectations to, you know, going into competitions and I just wanted to win another demon, another demon, another demon. And eventually it's not fun anymore. So you you didn't have that at all where you were chasing something and it didn't happen. And then you got frustrated. I don't think so because I mean, like, don't get me wrong. I've, I've, I have lost a competition way more than I've won. You know, this is the thing I I always talk about all of us. Right. That's just the nature of the thing. You know, I, the, the first golden demon I won, I entered seven pieces. Only one of those won a demon. That means I lost six times and won one time. Right. Yeah. So when I entered, you know, that... I, I had a year that was 2013 when the German golden demon shut down and they didn't have one anymore. Uh, I went there with 11 pieces. So as many categories as I could enter. And I really um, pushed hard and, and I made these entries really, you know, f- from my perspective, uh, the best I can do. And I only won three. So I, what I what actually mattered to me more was that I lost. Yeah, eight, you lost eight. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say no in general. Like there has been moments where I was where I've been angry at at that kind of thing. But I don't know if it's just the nature of my personality failure is something that drives me on to to beat it right like i don't know why i just it when i when i lose at something i'm like no i can do better i know i can i can prove myself i can improve that's fine if i wasn't good enough this time i'll be good enough next time uh and so it it it's kind of drives me that way and i'll also say this a lot of my painting isn't for competition right and i think that helps because i i I think if you just do that, if you only try to paint for competition, you will burn out, right? Because it requires a level of, of everything, of mental exertion that becomes exhausting. That's why I do still enjoy doing army painting in the middle because I can, I can go paint a unit for a game and I can take it to a high quality, but I don't have to worry about that last 10%. And I can feel good about it, you know, and know that like, Hey, by army standards, that's really great. And I feel like that did well, you know, like I did a good thing there. Now it wouldn't win any painting competition in the world. Right. But I don't care. That's not what its purpose is. And so it lets me be more cathartic. Right. Uh, yeah. So I think that's, it's, I, that's why I think I vary my project so much. It helps keep me even. Right. So I don't get too far down one place where I start banging my head up against the wall and and invest all of myself into that. Yeah, I was about to say. So when you have uh, obviously you're pouring a lot of time into an entry and then you have that one entry or two entries and that's basically becomes you identify (laughs) with that entry. It's it's all of you, all your creativity, all your heart poured into it and then it gets rejected because it didn't win anything. And then you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> and when you have a lot of things that bring you joy within that hobby on the side, then that gets buffered a lot easier, I think. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's exactly mm-hmm. right. So have you done commission painting at all? Not mm-hmm. really. Um, Any particular I, Something reason? I've never enjoyed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why. I just don't enjoy it. I like painting for me. Now, that's not to say I've never done commission pieces. So I have on occasion. Uh, I, I've done a little tiny bit of commission work for people that usually uh, because of something special. So, for example, uh, there was a person in the Warhammer community who is doing a, a thing called Go Trek, Glorious Go Trek. When they re-released the Go Trek miniature, he wanted to give away a special community award for the person who did the best over a whole year of tournament play with GoTrek in their list. 
and he wanted a special go trek to to do that so he reached out to me and i said sure i'll i'll, I'll do that and you know I, normally i would charge this very high amount for that like i i know what i i still have a cost structure if somebody wanted to come at me for a commission and i said but i'll, I'll cut you a deal and and we'll do it this way and 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 because I thought it was a really good idea and it was a cool, fun community thing. And I thought that was, that's something I was happy to do, right? I'm not just painting for someone's personal army. Uh, there's a tournament I go to and support a lot here for Age of Sigmar here in the States called NashCon. And every year we do the the TO, who's a good friend of mine, uh, I do a prize where the person who gets last place, they can, they can tell me what miniature they want to paint. I'll paint a single character miniature for them. Um, as a reward for them getting last place, right? So it's a, so they can have a cool miniature to start their next army or or whatever they want to do, right? So that's the kind of stuff I enjoy doing when it comes to that. I can't imagine myself being a commission artist where like a box shows up at my door with a hundred Space Marines and is like, I need this all to look like, you know, Ultramarines, X Legion, whatever, whatever. I would, I would just immediately throw the box back out the front door and be like, nope, never painting again. Wait, yeah, I have to do research into. Warhammer Lord. <laughs> Wait a right, second. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No. Um No, I'm the same. I I took a commission I think it's a year ago now for a Primark and I need to finish it and I'm about halfway there. Um and there was no time pressure at all, but I didn't want to say yes because I it's it's weird when I'm Painting for others, it's a weird feeling. It's, I have to give that away. And like we said, I'm always pretty attached, especially when it's a higher level of a paint job, then there's so much of my myself in that miniature that I just get too yes. attached to. Yes, 100%. Yeah. I, I have all like... A... <laughs> I want to die surrounded by my <laughs> by my miniatures. I've I've the only I, I don't sell stuff off. I don't you know do much in the way so of of uh, of those commission pieces we discussed. And I told my wife, look, when I die, you can just sell off my collection however you feel is appropriate. I don't care. I'm I'm going to be dead at that point. But the reality is, I just I love everything about it, and you put so much of yourself into it. I just love walking into my office and seeing the stuff that I've painted over the years. Like it makes me happy to just look at them. Right. And some of them, I actually legitimately hate the paint jobs on at this point. Like that is to say, I don't feel the work is very good, but I still like looking at them. If that makes weird sense, because I see part of my journey. Exactly. In them. Yeah. You see a, a memento of your past and how you developed from, from that step or, you know, from a previous step into that step and then so on. It's kind of fun. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like a photo album, but for your, but for something tangible, right? It's not just a place you happen to be. It's a thing you did. Yeah, that, yeah exactly. That's a, a good, good way to put it. So, uh, going back to the teaching aspect, um, what was the motivation to start a YouTube channel? Oh, I, I, there was a lot of assumption in that because I said teaching. I actually don't know if that was the the driver uh, behind it to teach others? Sure. So some part of having a YouTube channel is ego, right? Like that's everybody who has a YouTube channel has some kind of ego because you have to believe that whatever you're saying or doing is worth another human being on the planet yeah. listening to, mm -hmm. right? Um, so certainly I, I have that. But I originally, so I, my, my path to it was somewhat meandering. Like I was painting a little bit, enjoying myself and I was start, starting to take painting more seriously. And one day I was sitting here at my desk and I thought to myself, huh, I wonder if there's like stuff about this on YouTube, which sounds like the funniest thing to say, right? This is probably 2013. Mm -hmm. This is before I had really gotten, you know, into taking anything too seriously. And I went and looked and I found a channel from a gentleman in the UK named Reef, uh, Reefy Reef, Reef Beastman, who's a wonderful guy and ended up becoming a, a, a good friend. And I just started following his channel and interacting with him and blah, blah, blah. And then he, he kind of turned me on to other channels in 
Warhammer and I found other channels that were doing painting at the time. There wasn't as much in like 2013 as there is now, but there was some out there. And so I started finding those and learning from those and watching a lot of that. And then eventually I just thought, huh, well, I'd like to, I'll, I'll, I'll make my own thing. And like my early videos are just outright, I mean, abysmal because it's me like ter taking my old laptop that's still sitting here and using like the webcam from 2008 or seven or something that was on it, right? That was built into it and just recording a thing where I talk at it. And then eventually I thought, you know, I, I've got stuff that I like doing. I, I love painting. I've, I've always liked teaching and sharing knowledge with people. I take a lot of joy out of it. Uh, I just enjoy watching other people feel like they did something and and taking sort of a step on their hobby journey. It's just a cool thing to to be there with them when that happens. And so I thought, oh, so I'll, maybe I'll record some tutorials. And so I kind of started with a simple webcam and just fell into it. I had no plan. I had no great thought of what I was going to want to do. I just knew that I liked saving time. And so I thought, well, I cheat all the time. That's what I do. So I'll make hobby cheating. That'll be my thing, right? How to cheat at this, how to, how to, how to accomplish the same stuff in less time. That's always been a huge focus of, of my stuff. And yeah, so I just kind of went from there. Yeah, it's kind of funny because um, it, on my streams and, and, you know, videos, not so much, but um, whenever we talk about, for example, airbrushing, then people always bring up the meme of, okay, airbrushing is cheating. Um, so how, how how serious are you about, you know, that whole thing actually being cheating or is it just <laughs> a meme? Because, I mean, in the end, who cares? Um, as long as... Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's just yeah, a meme okay. <laughs> to me. Like, I love the joke yeah. of it, right? There is no such thing as as cheating. That's like saying that flying in airplanes are cheating because they get you to a destination faster than a steamer ship or driving in your car. Like, we would never think that about that kind of a thing, right? It is it is a tool in your toolbox. It has a set of skills, things that it's good at and things that it's not, right? And you, the, what you, you, you have to learn it and get good with it like you do any other tool. Uh, it's the same with any of the tools we utilize. And I, I use it as, as sort of a joke thing of like, there is, it's meant to be a joke, right? Of like, it's cheating in that I'm going to show you how to accomplish the same stuff faster. That's like wet blending would fall into the same thing, by the way. Like that's a cheating technique, right? Instead of laying down these using oil paints instead of acrylic sometimes to be cheating because oils take seven days to dry. And so you can blend them forever, right? Like, is that all cheating? No, of course not. But it's a joke to say so, right? Um, so, and, you know, look, my YouTube videos are so, I approach them much like I approach the miniature, which is to say uh, I, I got them out there and I felt the content was more important uh, than, than having good quality certain things. And over time, I've managed to, I hope, have better sound and better video and learn how to, like, actually be in focus and keep my miniature on the camera most of the time i'd say i'm up to like 80 90 percent i can stay in frame just the other day i was watching a video that i was that like yesterday i was watching a video that i was putting together and i realized there was a decent portion of the third part of the video where i was off camera and i was like well that's fine here we go again just vince being vince going off camera can't help himself yeah that's funny because one of the first youtube video streams i did because i was only streaming on twitch for like a year and then Eventually, I had to just drop the streams, the, the daily streaming, because it was, uh, I'll be honest, it was not uh, making money at all. And I just invested eight hours, you know, seven to eight hours of my daily time into streaming. Um, right. And it just got nowhere, so I had to drop it. So what I, what I did was, because I had a community, I started streaming on, on YouTube once a week. And then I, because someone said something like that, because uh, do you know Vince Ventura? Something about being yeah, in, in frame. frame. And, yeah, since somebody commented. And then yeah. I said, yeah, just like, like Vince always does it, like painting out a frame. And then you're like, oh, hi, by the way. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> But I can Yep, I'm always around, buddy. I'm always, always watching. watching. But I, I, I kind of knew you were cool about it because you just knew that sometimes you had that problem. I mean, it's the same thing when I paint. I, I have the camera like here, and then sometimes I do this, yeah. and then 
my head is in the camera. Your head goes in the frame, yeah. You Painting for camera, so I don't know if people know that, probably not, but painting for the camera is really difficult. Um, it's so hard. People do not understand how yeah. hard it is because it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. People want you to be as close to the miniature as possible, right? Because they want to see the detail, which cool, I get it. I, I would want to see the thing I'm talking about too. But when you zoom in that close, it gives you a point where you have to be like holding your miniature and you've got this much mm -hmm. movement in your hand, right? Like if you go more than an inch, you're going to fall out of frame somewhere because you have to be that zoomed. And the problem is when I paint like, you know, when I paint, I sit there and I'm like, I'll paint like this for a minute. And then I lean back in my chair and I paint like this. And then I'll brace my elbows and I lean to the side and I move over here. And then I come over here to work on a detail. You know, I'm just, I'm all over the shop when I'm doing it, not on camera. So it's very different for me. I'm, I'm a wiggle worm. I can't help myself. And when I have to paint on camera to like lock myself into a position is so tough. Yeah. With the new space, I had to, I tried a few different things. Um, but I'm probably going to go back to, like you said, just having the uh, the elbows on the table and then painting like that and then just moving the camera more up. So I have to do that because I tried going down on the table, but then I, I, I can't properly reach with my magnifying glasses and I just need to have the magnifying glasses because I want to paint to a certain standard. So it's really uncomfortable and I don't know how my back survived a full year of streaming for eight hours per day. <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculous <laughs> yes but i i certainly am cool about it because i know it's a weakness like i really do try but at the same time i really do screw up a lot so it's fine you got to be honest with yourself you know i i hope the content is still useful and at least my what i am showing and the words that i'm saying are, are helpful to me no it so, definitely yeah. is um because there's so much content on youtube that is you know about the fancy toys we paint. Um, but there's not, well, I guess nowadays there is, but you started that like eight years ago, I think. Um, it's yeah. been a while, yeah. It's, it's really six years of doing exactly. this. Exactly, yeah. and ever since you started, you were really sharing knowledge that when people listen to it, is going to give them, you know, bring them forward a lot. And um, to me, it's, I mean, I guess I know why, because YouTube is about entertainment and all that. Uh, it's not really so much. And even if you are watching something that is educational, you kind of need, or, you know, the audience kind of needs that uh, edutainment factor in there and it has to be fun and edited um, and stimulating, visually stimulating. I, I don't know who said it, but uh, someone said that watching someone paint the miniature is really not entertaining. And it's kind of sad because, like I said, so, so many people are looking for uh, tutoring, t tuition uh, on getting better with their stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just your stuff is just so underrated and it's kind of sad. <laughs> well, thank you. That's very, very nice of you no, to say. No, it's true. But I don't mind because at the same time, like, you know, I know there are things that I could probably do better. And I, I, I for me, it's not a big bang thing. I just slowly work on it over time. You know, I, I try to uh, just slowly up my game. This isn't my main gig. You know, like I'm, I have the luxury of not doing this for a living. I want it to be helpful. And I try to always engage with people, be there to answer their questions. That's if people are getting helped by it, I'm happy. Right. It's And it's not like no one's watching it. Right. There's uh, a few thousand people watching it and they are getting better. So you, you just kind of have to balance how much of it can you do in your free time? Uh, without interfering with your job and family and all that and right yeah, yeah. exactly and I, I sorry you know on. I don't have x hours a week to do a lot of editing and, and to do that kind of stuff because it's just not my job so I try my best to focus in on on the lessons I can communicate and what I feel like I can do effectively in that amount of time and at the same time every so often do a, a good video where you paint a space marine leg or something like that you know something that you know will get will 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 help people find your channel right and then hopefully they'll stick around and, and go check out the other stuff you do too. yeah i mean that's a bit of a problem right because when you when we are saying that's a good video we kind of mean in the framework of youtube uh it's a good video because it um you know has high energy level um you know 
editing that um, stimulates that audiovisual uh, beast that we have in ourselves that needs stimulation. But it might be crap content. It might not tell you anything. So that's a good video on YouTube. Um, but it's not a good video that we as teachers want to do because it doesn't transport right. anything for people to learn. They might think they learn something, but it's... Yeah, for me, it's just a mix. I, I end up doing, like, all my stuff is very technique-focused because that's what I enjoy. And by the way, I'm glad that other people make videos more, more focused on sure. entertainment and some make it more focused on learning because I watch all of them. I watch everybody on YouTube, more or less, who's painting miniatures because I just love to watch people paint miniatures and share their experience with it. Uh, I, I mean, I'm a huge, huge, huge consumer of this content. When I paint for three, four hours, usually it's about four hours every day. It depends on sort of how early my meetings are the next morning. I'm, I'm a night owl type of person. Uh, that is one place where we are very different because I know how early you get up and you're a madman. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I'm, I'm a night owl person. My wife tends to go to bed earlier, so I always have, let's call it at least three, usually four hours a night every night where I'm painting. Uh, I need content to consume during that time. And there's nothing better for me than a nice long form video mixed up with a couple short entertainment videos that I'll watch. That's great. Yeah, I guess, you know? yeah, I guess it's, um, I would say as, as long as it's, it's kind of labeled as, I don't know. So that's my personal opinion, right? Um, I, I like videos that are entertaining. I just don't like that a lot of people see them as educational. So, I, I rather wish people would watch your videos a lot more to get educated if they want to be educated. Right. So that, that's just what I mean. Sure. So of course it, it, I it's, get it. it when you, like you said, when you want to consume something and just be entertained, then that's the perfect go-to because yeah, it's 100%. about miniature painting, There's just, right? Exactly. It's about a subject exactly. that I like. It's somebody doing something I like and you never know when you're going to learn something like you always do have to be open to to learning right um sometimes it's just one little thing that sticks with you from a video and if and and if you can get one little thing and internalize it and actually make it part of how you approach the hobby and it and it ups your game or helps you take your next step great then that was a huge win right however much time i spent there uh so yeah i mean that's i i am a avid and consumer and supporter of everyone who is taking the time out of their day to put content up for my enjoyment that I can consume at basically zero dollars. Yeah. It's an amazing gift of the world we live in. Yeah, I was going to say, and it's all out there for free. Um, yeah, exactly. That's why I always make sure like I'm sub to all these people. I hit like on all the videos, you know, like I, I try to do all the stuff that the, that <laughs> that I know I ask people to do for engagement because I know it does help in the algorithm mm -hmm. or whatever, right? Because I want to, I want to see everybody succeed there. There isn't, this isn't a world where there's a lot of competitive competition. And what I mean by that is because you watch one person's videos, it doesn't mean you can't watch another. In fact, it's probably the opposite of that, right? Uh, watching one person often will tend to make you want, help you watch another person's videos. You will start exploring deeper into that type of content. So there's a synergy as opposed to a Yeah, a that's the good thing about YouTube. It's not as much with live streaming because you only have that many hours in a day. And if you watch someone for eight hours, you're probably going to miss a lot of the content that someone else puts out. But on YouTube, um, I don't think it needs to be a competition because I can watch person A that focuses more on entertaining. And then I can watch you that um, might give me new ideas when it comes to techniques and all that. Um, and I can do that, nice you know, to meet you. I can watch five videos in a day or just two. And then on the weekend I watch more. So it's not an exclusively, uh, I can only watch this person or that person. I can learn from everyone. And I always try to do that too. Uh, it absolutely, yeah, to me, it's just kind of gets annoying when there's fandom arising, uh, across um certain youtube channels and then they just pitch each other against you know <laughs> or the, the fans <laughs> say well no hmm, this other person w did that and so person b cannot be right about it and, and that gets kind of annoying especially to me because i really like to learn from everyone and that yeah. excludes it uh, you know just being able to have, have an open mind about those things 
Well, I'm fascinated by the fact that so many people approach the whatever they're doing in different ways. I love to watch how different people how different people attack projects and paint and think about paint and stuff like that. It is one of the great and amazing things about this hobby that there's no one right way, right? It's like saying, well, which road do you take to get to your city that you live in? Well, there's not one road. There are many roads that you could take to get into the city, including also, by the way, trains and planes and all sorts of different things, right? So uh, to me, it's always just fascinating to watch how different people attack uh, the same project in, in using different tools, techniques, roads, paths, planning, whatever, whatever. They're all right. They can all be right. Find the one that matches to you. Right. So in that... Mm, in that yeah, vein of you. thinking? You were doing the... I, when did you start the interview with the artist videos? Was that last year or even before? Yeah, yeah last year. Yeah, last year. I don't know when. I think beginning of the year-ish is probably about right. Yeah. So why did you start that? What was the interesting thing about it? I love almost everybody who paints in this hobby. Like, I think it's an amazing community to be part of. I'm just so fascinated and in awe of well, everybody's work. I spend most of my day looking at other people's miniatures whenever I'm on social media of any kind, right? That is to say, all of my social media feeds are tuned to just look at people painting, right? And so social media for me is a very positive thing because all I'm just looking at is people sharing their hobby. And no politics. I thought, no, no, no politics, stuff. no, none of that, no celebrity no gossip, case. none of that. Nope. Uh, I mean, every so often a cat video comes in because you can't stop yeah. that, right? F Facebook is very Facebook knows I like dogs, and so shows me dog videos. And I'm not gonna lie, I do stop and watch cute dogs because I love dogs and dogs are adorable. Um, but other than that, that that still makes me happy. That's not a controversial thing. Watching a cute dog do something cute is, you know, that's a way to brighten your day. Um, but I I I knew I I, I wanted to share other artists journeys and so it just kind of occurred to me that this would be a really fun thing to do and i uh, count uh, many of the sort of u.s artists uh, amongst my my friends and I'm, I'm i'm lucky to to do so and i thought hey why not actually share their stuff out and i thought what a great way to help them spruik whatever they're working on to help them boost the signal of whatever they're doing whatever they want to share and really it's just a it's a clever excuse for me to get to sit down with them for an hour hour and a half talk about their journey understand them what they like what they don't like because i just love talking about this hobby i love talking about miniature painting and so <laughs> I would do it for hours and hours anyways. It just became a good excuse to get together and do it, yeah, right? Definitely. Um, so as a closing question, other than practice, 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 what uh, is the best thing to do to get better at miniature painting? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I don't agree with practice, practice, practice. Let's let's go ahead and just bust another myth, since that's uh, since that's what you and I do when we get together. Uh, practice does nothing, or very little, I should say. Deliberate practice does a lot, right? And what I mean by that is, I think that that, and, and it sounds like I'm saying the same thing, but it's really not. You can sit there and paint for years. I painted for years, and my skill went basically nowhere because I wasn't deliberately trying to push myself. I was using the same technique repeatedly just to get things done. Maybe I gained a tiny amount of brush control. Maybe I understood how my paints work a little bit, but I wasn't really putting the thought into it. Deliberate practices, I'm gonna sit down and I wanna work on my, you know, my uh, sort of reflective lighting. I wanna understand better how to capture blue tinged non-metallic metals. I want to work on the lighting on a human face and the color and, and hues in a human face. That's deliberate practice, doing that. But honestly, the best thing you can do is be part of a group that gives you regular feedback where you are not the best painter in that group, <laughs> right? Yeah. Find a group where you are not the best person and uh and and get lots of regular feedback like competing was probably the thing that upped 
my ability to achieve what I wanted to with painting more than anything else. Because I would go to a competition, lose a lot, talk to the judges, get a lot of feedback. Like I always made it a point to talk to judges and understand where I failed and then work on that stuff specifically, then apply deliberate practice on those things. So regular feedback from people who are better than you, right? Or who understand more than you or whatever, if people take umbrage with my use of the term yeah, better yeah. than you, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Who have the knowledge base that is, is broad enough to judge what you're doing. Uh, I think nothing will help you take a step faster than that. That's one of the reasons that I do the the PMP type of review that I did, right? So I have my my Facebook miniature painting community, and once a month I sit down and I, I invite people to post a mini into this event we do every month, and then I give them, you know, three to four minutes of review about where they should work to take their next step every month, and I do that so I can try to pay some of that forward, right? Of all the good help other people have given me, hopefully I can hopefully I can pass some of that on to others. That's my hope. Do you do you feel like people are using that feature uh, enough, or do you think there's not enough people using it? Uh, every month I have probably between 60 and 100 okay. to go through. So I feel like it's about yeah, the yeah. right amount any more. And I would start, admittedly, I would start collapsing under the weight of it. Like there is probably some upper limit because if you do, let's just imagine a world where I do three minutes of review per piece. That means I can do 20 in an hour. If there's 100, that's five hours of recording I have to do to do those reviews. Uh, it's doable, but you know it, it is mentally taxing and exhausting it, to do that much feedback, and it, it's it's draining. Like when I finish up one of those videos, I'm just like, ugh, I melt into my chair because it's you have to be on, like really on and really looking at every miniature. Like you have to be dialed in a thousand percent. Uh, but I like doing it. Yeah, so that's why I take one day of the week to do it on my Discord. Uh, server yep. because I can't do it all the time because I really have to put myself into the mindset and have the right focus and just switch that button on and then I yeah it's better to go for an hour or two or three um, than just do it all the time which I know that you know people would like to progress on their projects and they upload it you know maybe when I'm asleep and then they have to wait until I wake up but then I really can't do it when I wake up because I'm still not in that mindset and then I just have to take a day where I wake up with the goal in mind of just working through all the feedback requests that are on the server. So I... Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think you have to channel mm -hmm. it, right? Because you're, it's easy to get inundated. And I want to help. Don't get me wrong. It's not... It, it is it, like that is one of my absolute mission statements and values I try to live by. But you can't do it all the time. Otherwise, it just becomes it's a, it's just a well you can fall into. Right. So you have to channel it in some place where this is the place where mm -hmm. I do that thing. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, so for people that, you know, don't know you, maybe um, I guess everyone knows your YouTube, hopefully by now um, that has been watching. And if they don't, hopefully they're going to drop you a follow, too. Um, yeah, hey, how you doing, new people? Very nice to meet you. I'm glad that you you watched through this whole thing, not knowing who I was, but I'm I'm honored you did so. Come see me on YouTube. I'd love to have you on the hobby. Yeah, I'm journey. sure twelve people did. So that's twelve <laughs> new subscribers for for you right there. Yes, got him. <laughs> so yeah, just plug every social media uh, site or presence you have, or whatever pre presence you sure. want to plug. Sure. So if you if you uh, if you just search out my name, you'll probably find most of it. But uh, it's at Warhammer Weekly or Vincent Venturella on Twitter, um, at Vincent at Vincent Venturella on Instagram, just Vincent Venturella on Facebook. I uh, I didn't go the way of having a cool name. Like I don't know where your name came from, but it's a super cool name. It's a good brand. Uh, I don't have that. I just was like, well, this is my name because again, I didn't give any forethought to this when I started it all off. So my channel is just my name. Everything's just my name, which I guess makes it kind of easy, but it's not snappy. There's nothing that rolls off the tongue. Um, Actually, kind of, but yeah, you can find does. everything there. I mean, Vincent Venturella. That's. I was lucky enough to have an exactly, alliterative yeah. name. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, so you can find everything there on all that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram, YouTube. I don't do much else. Uh, so, yeah, there you it's go. It's a lot to keep up to date anyway. So, <laughs> Yes, yes. The endless well of the socials that we... I don't have a TikTok or anything like that. Sorry. So I'm uh, I'm too old for that. Uh, but yeah, just, just those. Great. Well, I just want to say uh, my username was not a great choice because especially you American people always butcher it. Is it not Trevarian? Am I, am I butchering no, no, it when no. I say You're that? No, no, no. You're pronouncing it correctly. But I think because of the pronun pronunciation, people think there's an A at the end and it's actually an O. I don't think O-N is, is, a, is really common in English. It's more A-N at the end. So it was not a wise choice of a username. <laughs> or as a brand, you know. But where, where does... Well, look. So where does... How many of us actually have a good, like, come up and at the beginning go, this is the brand that I am going to live and die by, right? That's not, that's not the yeah, world we Yeah, I was going in. to say, because I came up with it 20 years ago when I was starting to play online games, and then I just hit a button on a, a random name generator, and the first thing that came up was that. So it has been my online presence name ever since, so... Nice. That's nice. That's the origin. So some MMO it has uh, it has gifted us this name, is what yep, you're telling planetarian me. Planetarian for those people that remember, as old as me. Uh, oh, I know Planetary. Yes, absolutely. I remember that one. One hundred percent. So much time wasted. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably do a whole nother show on you know things we wasted our life on that wasn't miniature painting, like MMOs. Yes, absolutely. Many, 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 many months of my life Definitely. gone. Definitely. Well, Vince, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, yeah. Follow Vince. Happy to do so, buddy. Follow Vince uh, wherever you can. You can learn a lot from him, and he's also really, really fun to talk to. I hope we can do this again. Maybe. Anytime. Maybe do it around some topic and maybe a bit of a shorter thing, more focused. Uh, with less rabbit holes but yeah thanks again bye everybody happy to help buddy bye